Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here. As I was chatting beforehand with, with uh, some of the earlier folks, this is the first time I've ever presented in India, and I'm very excited about that. Hopefully one day I'll actually get to present in India, in India, if you see what I mean, rather than in dark and uh, cold, well, not so cold actually today, but Chicago, which is where I am at the moment. Uh, something I think, uh, Anchor, we were, we were going to say was that there's a Q&A button, I think, a widget in the bottom right-hand corner. If people have questions during my presentation, feel free to click there and, and put your question in the, uh, the top, the, sorry, bottom right-hand corner window. There's a little triangle and square and circle you can click and bring up the Q&A panel. And I'll try my best to answer them as we go, though I've asked the organizers to interrupt me if, it's, if there's too many things in the queue and we're moving on. So thank you again for having me. Uh, I'm going to be talking, as Ankur said, about some cool compi C++ compiler tidbits, which is just my excuse, really, to talk about the thing that I love, which is compilers and how clever they are. So first of all, you've already given me a fantastic introduction. So half of these slides are unnecessary. But hi, everyone. I'm accidentally a verb. And I never planned on becoming a verb. As you said, um, Compiler Explorer was an idea I had so getting on for 10 years ago now. Uh, it'll be its 10th birthday um, sometime next year. So we're nine years now it's been up. And uh, it's kind of really changed my life, right? The reason that I'm talking to you all is because of the site and the sort of notoriety, uh, the fame, fame that has come with it. Um, so thank you to the community for uh, <laughs> um, giving me this opportunity. It's fantastic. But really what I want to talk to you about today is just how amazing compilers are and how they make your life easier and that we don't often uh, understand the lengths and the, the, the amount of uh, amazing technology that goes into our compilers so that we can write code that is easy for us to understand, easy for our colleagues to understand, and yet still very performant and uh, um, we can trust the compiler to take our code and make something beautiful for the, the CPU to execute. So when we think about compilers, well, when I first started, um, as Anka said, I, I started in the games industry. And I always thought a compiler was something which takes code like this, which is some made up rendering code. And it's a, it's a tool to an end. You know, In this instance, this would get you a game, right? I worked on uh, Xbox games, which was lots of fun. And the compiler was a tool that I used to get there. And that's great. Um, very often, the uh, the type of thing that I see nowadays when I'm working with a compiler is I've written some template code like this, and the compiler is a great tool for turning my code into thousands and thousands of complicated lines of error message that I don't fully understand. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. You know, we all have our trials and tribulations of getting the thing to compile in the first place, and things are getting a lot better. Compiler error messages are a lot better these days. But today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be talking to you about code on the left turning into beautiful, gorgeous assembly code. And it's to me, it's a kind of poetry. Uh, the way that assembly looks and the way that you can understand assembly, I want to try and give you the feeling that I have, which is that it is like uh, reading uh, Shakespeare Right, so Shakespearean poetry uh, is hard to read because it's written in an old version of English, in my case, uh, and the, the way that it's written is strange and unusual, and there are strange rules about which parts rhyme and which parts don't rhyme, but I can appreciate it for its beauty and if I, without necessarily understanding it perfectly. And that's the kind of thing I want to leave with you, is this idea that you don't have to understand every single little detail of the assembly code that generated, uh, that's generated by your compiler. But if you understand just enough, you can squint your eyes a little bit and appreciate what the compiler is doing for you. And hopefully that's what you'll pick up today. So yes, assembly, I've said it. We're going to be seeing quite a bit of assembly in this talk. And for many people, it looks like something that's un unintelligible. You don't understand what this is. This is, in fact, uh, from the Lord of the Rings. So there's, <laughs> I, I don't know. There may be people, scholars, who can read uh, the speech of the Lord of the Rings, but I can't. And so many people just glaze over when you say, oh, I'm going to show you some assembly code. I remember vividly uh, working in the uh, games industry when 
uh, there were, were people who would um, have issues and their comp code would crash and then they would look at the assembly code and go, I don't know what this is. I'm just going to stop now. I'm just going to ask somebody else for help. And I, I don't want you to feel that way. I want you to understand enough of it. So I'm going to give you a crash course on x86-64 assembly. So this is the code that most uh, desktop machines and most um, servers will run. And that's what most of my examples are going to be in today. In fact, that's what all of my examples are going to be in today. Of course, there are other types of assembly code. There are other CPUs out there, most notably ARM processors, which are now very important um, in both the mobile space and with like Apple moving towards them for their, their, um, their products. So we're going to see a lot more of ARM on the market. And for those of you who have done uh, university courses, often MIPS assembly or RISC-V is used. And I don't know enough about those to be able to teach or use them as examples. I will say that um, if we learn a little bit of the x86-64, while it is very specific to Intel, it is generally useful to just understand how CPUs work, because although they speak different languages, the fundamental things they do are the same. So when I'm talking about x86 as, uh, assembly, what we're looking at is a pattern of text output, which looks like the name of an instruction, like this first line, or the name of an instruction and an operand. And you can think of this like a, a function and the parameters to a function. And there can be several operands. And the, the, the leftmost of those operands will be the destination. Let me give you some examples of those. So this, these are like examples using different numbers of operands. So this first example here, ret, is an instruction which says, I've finished doing what I'm doing. Go back to what I was doing before. This is used at the end of a, a function, of a subroutine. Uh, another example would be inc racks, and that means increment the thing called racks. And we'll go and talk about what racks is in a second, so don't worry about that. But it's just an example of uh, a single parameter to an instruction, a single operand to an instruction. That operand in this instance is both a source and a destination because it's incrementing. It's like reading it, adding one to it, and writing it back again. We can have two operand instructions, like this mov. This mov means put the value one, two, three, four into the EDX register. We can add things together. And now this is a quirk of the x86 that you won't see, for example, on ARM. With the operations like adds and multiplies and divides, very commonly, the limitation on the x86 is that you can't have uh, three operands. You can only do two, which means that they always end up being things like a plus equals or a minus equals or a divided equals or a times equals. You can't have A equals B plus C. You just have to do A plus equals B. And that makes the code a bit awkward. It's just a limitation of the, the system. You don't normally have to worry about it. Um, just be aware of it. And then the more modern instructions that have come out as the processes have evolved do actually have these three operands. And so this is a three operand thing which says that whatever YMM is is equal to YMM2 plus YMM0. So hopefully that's just enough to get you your eye in with these. We'll give a few examples. Um, these are the top 20 instructions that I, I sampled randomly on my computer. I was actually running Compiler Explorer and doing some stuff, and I write, wrote a piece of code to say, keep sampling and see what instruction is running right now. And these were the top ones. So th these are most commonly executed instructions. So to give you an idea, uh, these four here, the MOV, MOV ZX, MOV SX, and LEA, are all about copying or moving values into registers. Uh, so those are very commonly used. MOV means move a value into a register. The ZX and the SX mean zero extend and sign extend. You don't really need to worry about that. LEA is special, and we'll talk about that later. But those are just basically moving information around. In order to have control flow, we need to be able to call subroutines, return from subroutines, and jump around within the code for like a, a go to. Now, of course, we never write go to in our code, but ultimately the CPU has to be able to do a go to. And that's what call, ret, and jump are about. We have a stack. Um, we're going to manipulate it by pushing and popping values from the stack. That's how we deal with things like uh, recursion in, in functions. The, the stack is going to store the previous um, caller's state, and we can return back to it. Uh, we need to be able to do comparisons and conditionals. Like, So we want to be able to do a loop. We're going to count up, and we're going to compare with our loop counter. Is it reached the, the end of the loop? And if it is, we will jump. Uh, if it isn't, sorry, we will jump if not equal back round to the top of the loop. So this is the compare and test, which are 
essentially the same for the purposes of, of this conversation. And then JE means jump if equal and JNE means jump if not equal. So you will see examples of these in place and hopefully that will cement this a bit more. Then finally, we get to some instructions that actually do things, right? Actually do logical operations that you might think about when you're you're actually uh, programming, right? These other ones are, are mostly about like uh, the manipulation of going into subroutines and coming out of subroutines. Finally, over here, these instructions like to and or exclusive or add, subtract, shift, left, shift, right, and shift arithmetic. So these are the top 20 instructions. There are obviously very, very many more. And you might be a bit surprised to see that exclusive or is a commonly run instruction because I don't know about you, I very rarely use the little carrot, the little hat thing in my C code or C++ codes to actually do any exclusive or. But we'll see why that is common. And obviously, there are many, many more. But if you understand the shape of those instructions, those are most of the instructions that you're going to see in the output of your compiler. And then all the other ones you can Google when you, uh, when you come across them, which is what I do. I don't know all the instructions by a long margin. So I sort of waved my hands a bit and just said the operands are a bit like the parameters you pass to a function. And there are limited a set of things those operands can be. They can be a register, which is what we've already talked about. I said racks and RBX, and I'll explain a little bit more about what those registers are in a second. They could be a constant, and we've also seen that. Remember, we saw one, two, three, four. That was a, a, a value that was just a constant, just an, a, a constant that is stored in the instruction itself. And then on, this is now into quite specific x86 territory. It can be quite a complicated expression that reads from memory. So for example, we can say that one of the operands is whatever is pointed to by this memory location, where the memory location might be it's stored in a register. Uh, or it can be the memory location found in a register plus some offset. Or it can even be a register plus an offset plus another register and that other register can be multiplied by one or two or four or eight. So it's a very strange set of things that you can do, but that's just how the architecture came out. The Intel engineers decided that these would be useful things, useful primitives for folks to build things on top of. To give you an example of what I mean by uh, one of these instructions, this add here is a single instruction. That's like an, an, the atomic smallest unit that you can give a, the x86 to execute. And it's the equivalent to this complicated line of C here, where I'm saying EAX plus equals, because it's add EAX, D word putter, which means I'm going to treat this as if it's an int pointer or a double word in Intel speak. And the address that I'm going to read from is RDI plus 12 plus RSI times four. And these are two registers here. So this is like a very complicated expression, right? This is very complicated. And Again, I say this is kind of peculiar to the x86 because you won't find these on RISC-V, you won't find this on MIPS, and you won't find this on ARM. This is kind of one of those things that separates the RISC chips that are very reduced instruction, very simple chips like, like ARM and MIPS from the complicated instruction set CISC chips that the Intel is, right? This is a very complicated instruction, I'm sure you'll agree. That's a, it gets more complicated, that, more blurry than that recently, but at least in essence, that's part of it. OK, finally, I will tell you what these registers are. These are essentially the working memory of the CPU. And they're effectively global variables, right? We all, again, we don't write go-tos in our code, but the compiler has to uh, implement everything using jumps, which are effectively go-tos. And we really shouldn't be using globals in our code, but that effectively is all the poor compiler has to work with when it's dealing with the, the CPU, because it only has these registers, and then it has memory. So when we talk about registers, we have a set of them. And the way that registers are used has to be agreed between functions. So when you call a function, the receiving function needs to know where it's going to find the parameters to that function. And it also needs to have a contract to say, well, when I've run and I've generated a return value, where should that return value go? And it just so happens for Linux, at least, uh, on uh, x86, uh, the register called racks is used as the return value from a function. So if you're going to call a function and you're expecting a value back, once, you, the, once you've called that function, you should look in the racks register to find the result. If you're passing parameters into that function, then you put the first parameter in the RDI register and the second one in RSI, next one in RDX, 
and then so on. And there is a, there's a whole document that explains how these things should go into which registers. And obviously, these are these these um, actually are only integer registers. If there are floating point things going on, there's a different aspect to it there. But just get to give you the idea of where to look. And again, you don't necessarily need to know this, um, but it's useful to be able to interpret what uh, what registers contain what values if you're looking at just say one function. And then there's a whole bunch of other funnily named things like RBX, RCX, RBP. Um, and somewhere along the line, uh, when AMD came along and extended uh, the Intel instruction set with more registers, instead of coming up with more crazy names, they decided rather sensibly just to call the new, new registers R8 through R15. And then we'll also see these XMM registers, which are used for floating point and for SIMD in, um, operations. And there'll be one example of that towards the end, but most of the time we don't need to worry about those. So a register like racks is actually a 64-bit integer. These are general purpose 64-bit registers. But you can also call racks by a different name. If you, if you address racks and call it EAX, then you actually only see the bottom 32 bits of the value that was in the racks register. And if you call it AX or AX, you only get the bottom 16 bits. If you call it AL, you just get the bottom eight bits. So it's the same 64 bits, but you can view different aspects of it by calling these different, calling it these different names. And the interesting thing I find about this is that in some ways this shows us, it's almost like, um, you know, those uh, examples of uh, um, min min mineral deposits in um, uh, like a, an exposed cliff face. At the very top, you can see the recent things. And then as you go further down and you mine in, you can see uh, like the older and older history. So the very, very top here, this is the most recent, the 64-bit register, and uh, it's called RAX. And as we go down, we see the 32-bit EAX register. And that comes from the time when CPUs were only 32-bit, which itself is an extension on the 16-bit of the previous era CPUs, which itself was an extension of the 8-bit of the 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 8088 and the the Z80 and other things. So you can kind of see this historical lines in the sand, but that's unimportant right now. All we need to remember is that if we see racks, it means 64 bits, and if we see EAX, we mean 32 bits. Most of the rest of it you won't see in these examples. Okay, finally, with that's that's my my spiel about just giving you some grounding. I'm not expecting to have remembered all of that because we're going to see some things in context, and hopefully that will help it make more sense to you if you can see. Uh, the uh, intention of the code. But whenever we're looking at assembly, we're usually looking at assembly because we're interested in the performance of our code. And I want to make sure that I, I say this because while we are just going to be looking at assembly code, it's super, super, super important to realize for humans, it's incredibly difficult to intuit about the performance of code just by looking at the assembly. There are many, many things that affect the performance of code, not just how many instructions you see in the output. And so I would encourage you to use a benchmark application or a benchmark library to test your code rather than relying entirely on looking at assembly output. The assembly output can help you understand why your code is faster or slower, but it's very hard to tell ahead of time that your code will be fast or will be slow. So take a look at some of the other uh, libraries in there. But having said that, we are gonna spend the rest of this talk just looking at assembly. So I'm going to break my own rules here. So let's get on to the tip bits. Let's, let's start taking a look and taking a bit of a, uh, a journey along the, uh, the, the kind of things your compiler can do for you. So we're going to start with some simple things with maths, so that, or maths, as I would normally say. I forgot to edit this slide. If I, as I'm talking to a sort of more British English audience, this would be maths rather than math. But, you know, I've been over here for 10 years. So this is our super simple function. It's a test function. It takes x, it takes y, and it returns x minus y. And we're going to go and look at how the compiler interprets this code. Assuming everything goes well, I'm going to control click on it and drum roll. Yes, Compiler Explorer has opened, and we can see now on the left hand side the code, and on the right hand side the assembly that was generated from it. So I'm my my options up here, which are a bit small to see. Uh, I have the optimizer on level two. We'll look at some examples with it on full later on on optimizer level three. At the moment, I'm using optimizer level two because it generates reasonably understandable code without getting into all the very, very clever things the compiler can do, although we will talk about those. 
I am also targeting the Haswell range of CPUs, which are a somewhat contemporary set of, uh, of, of uh, CPUs, mainly so I can show you some of the cool instructions that the, the Haswell architecture and above has. And these, these are relatively common um, to have in computers these days. So let's take a look at the code. So if you remember, and I'm not going to do any testing on you, um, we know that the contract is that the person who is calling test is responsible for putting X into ESI and Y into EDI, or the other way around. Gosh, I've already forgotten. Um, sorry, it's early in the morning. We'll work it out. Uh, and uh, so, so we know that the, the two registers, ESI and EDI, are involved in the two parameters that are being passed in. And it is the responsibility of test to make sure that the result, x minus y over here, is left in the EAX register, because that's what the caller is expecting, or the RACS register. But here, these ints are 32 bits wide. So we're going to be using the E versions of those instructions. And so you might expect it to just be a single subtract instruction. And it would be on, say, an arm, where you can actually have the output go into a different location from the, the inputs. But because of the annoying minus equals kind of way that the, the Intel processors work, what happens is that the first thing we have to do is we need to put, um, well, let's try and work this out now. I'm going to do this on the fly. Uh, this, is, this must be Y. We're going to put, uh, no, this is X. Aha, EDI is X. So we're going to put the X into the EAX register. And then we're going to say EAX minus equals Y. So this MOV is sort of an annoying thing that we had to do just to move the things into the right place, ready for our subtract to do the work that we needed. Uh, so I think we can, we can follow this through. We're saying EAX equals the value X, EAX minus, equal, minus equals the value Y. And so the result X minus Y is left in the EAX register. And that's great. OK, so that's a, just a starting point. Let's start playing around and seeing what the compiler can do for us, because so far, this is pretty straightforward. I can, for example, um, change this to an add. Now, having looked at the, the, um, <clears throat> the list of instructions before, or even if you've been uh, um, exposed to assembly before, you might reasonably think that if I change this minus here to a plus, all we'll see is this word sub turning into add. And you'd, be, you'd probably be right, right? So let's just try it out. Oh, interesting, interesting. We changed it to an add, and the code changed absolutely completely, right? We've got a very different looking thing on the right-hand side. What has happened here is that the, the compiler has found a different instruction that is not designed for adding. It's not designed to be used for adding, but it just happens to have the right side effects for adding. And so it's used that instead of an add. Now. That seems weird. So let's talk about what this instruction is. This is the LEA instruction, which we talked about uh, only in terms of me just waving my hands during the MOV section of instructions. And what LEA does is it says load effective address. On the right-hand side of the instruction, it takes that complicated memory parameter. Now, if you recall, when we're talking with memory on the x86, we have that uh, base plus offset, plus another register times one or two or four or eight. That's a complicated expression. What the LEA instruction lets us do is to do that memory calculation, but not actually read from that memory address. Just give me back what address you would have read from. Now, of course, we're not doing any memory access here. This is not a memory um, based uh, function. There is no array that we're accessing. Um, but what we're saying is, what would be the address of a byte of memory that was at the address x plus an offset of y. And we're never going to read from that because that's not a valid location in memory. But it just is doing an add, right? That's all that memory addressing is doing. It's an add. And the compiler has said, well, that's useful to me because now I can add RDI plus RSI, which is the answer I want. And the side effect of the LEA instruction is that we can put the destination wherever we like. We actually have a way of putting it into the EAX where we need it to be for our caller. So we've managed to get away without that annoying MOV to move things around at the beginning. So that's pretty clever. So the compiler's doing this kind of trick for us already. 
So let's see what else it can do. Let's let's try something more more in, exciting. Let's try multiplication because we know that adding and subtracting is something we do all the time, but multiplying is also useful. And I don't know about you, um, multiplication is more complicated for me to do than addition. So I'm assuming it is harder for computers too. So let's just start with uh, a return x. Okay, well, that's just moving the input to the output, fine. Let's try x times two, and I'm expecting to see like a mul instruction. So x times two comes out with, oh no, we've got our LEA instruction back again. And so it's just using the LEA again as an add, and here it's just adding x with itself, x plus x, that's two x. Okay, we've managed to avoid doing uh, a, a multiply. Okay, what about four? Surely it has to do something clever here. Maybe it's going to use a shift, right? That's what I would think of as my with my video game hat on. X times four. It's still not using a shift. It's now using the LEA instruction, and it knows that it can use this multiply by one or two or four or eight. So the LEA instruction is being this very versatile instruction that's not actually being used for memory access as it was originally designed. And of course, if we do eight here, we're gonna see LEA times eight. But of course, if we now I'm thinking, well, what other numbers could we put in? If it's not a power of two, surely it's gonna to have to give up and do something using a multiply. So let's try seven. Well, again, it's constructed a multiply by seven by taking a multiply by eight and then subtracting one lot of X. So it's able to build all of these clever um, things to avoid a multiply um, out of these primitive adds and LEAs and subtracts and things. And so nine, obviously, we're going to see something else. There's even cleverer things like I, I can't I can't beat it. So let's just come up with a really big number, a six, five, five, nine, nine, whatever. So, yes, hooray. Finally, I'm cleverer than the compiler, surely, because I've been able to outsmart it here and. Um, you know, if I give it a big enough number, it gives up and, and just uses a multiply instruction. And in fact, on the on the Haswell, it, there is a three out operand multiply with a constant. So so it can even do it in one go. Right. We don't have to mod things around. So maybe this is a slow instruction. Um, and so I can probably beat the compiler. In fact, let's try and do it. I'm going to just go back to my other slides and see if we can beat the compiler, because I know something about the number six, five, five, nine, nine, six, five, five, nine, nine is actually 65,536 plus 64 minus one. So I can build a multiply by 65599 using these shifts. And we all know that shifts are very, very cheap to do, right? They're just moving the binary representation around and, and the CPUs are great at doing that kind of thing. So I can build a multiply, a bespoke multiply by 65599 instruction, sorry, function out of shifts and adds and subtracts. And this is bound to be better than the compiler. So I'm going to see how this compiles. Wow. So what has happened here is even though I have built this multiply myself out of shifts and adds, the compiler has gone, I see what you're doing and I'm going to save you from yourself. You're trying to be too clever. It has turned it back into the multiply because my intuition about adds and shifts and subtracts is out of date. The compiler is up to date. The compiler knows how fast CPUs are. It knows which instructions are faster than which other instructions. And so it has realized that I'm trying to do a multiply by 65599. And if it had done it in terms of shifts and adds, it would actually be slower. And so that's amazing, right? It has saved me for myself. It has been able to realize that um, my code is inefficient. And so I would be better off, really, just doing a times 65599, because then I don't need this big comment underneath, which is explaining what the heck it's doing, right? So write readable code, I suppose, is the, the thing to take away from this. Um, don't try and outsmart the compiler, because it's cleverer than you. And in fact, here, it's saved me from myself. It's actually been able to come back. So one interesting thing is, though, if I tell it that it's got an ancient CPU, if I tell it it's got a Pentium, and I'll do M32 here, it will actually stop emitting the multiply and it will use shifts and adds. So it knows which CPU it's going to be targeting. Now this Pentium is like 20 years old, so don't, don't think that this is a good thing to do. But the funny thing is, this is still not better than me just doing A times 65599 because it turns out the compiler knows these tricks too. And so even though it won't generate a multiply instruction, it will generate a much better set sequence of shifts and adds itself. So again, trust the compiler, tell it what you're doing, 
um, let it target the right CPU in this particular case. I've seen a couple of things. Uh, what is the trunk option? Someone's asked a couple of questions. I'll just take a moment to look at those. Uh, the trunk option of compilers in Compiler Explorer, which I don't, oh, I do have some of them here. These are daily builds of GCC. So I go and get the latest code from GCC and Clang and I build them every day and that's what we get on the site. So that's that one. Um, and then there's no overflow errors. No, the the overflow errors, uh, uh, the compiler won't emit overflows um, on, on purpose. It, it There are some all sorts of undefined behavior things that we have to ad, um, adhere to as um, users of C and C++ undefined behavior, but the compiler knows the limitations and knows where, how overflows happen, so we're okay on that front. Um, why is the compiler trying to avoid IML by using LEA? A multiplication is a multiplication anyway. So LEA, um, uses shifts and adds only. So in, in terms of the circuitry that's inside the CPU, multiplying by one or two or four or eight is really, 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 really cheap. It's just like humans multiplying by powers of 10. You know, it's easy to add, multiply one, two, three, four by 100 because you just put two zeros on the end, right, as a human. For computers, it's very easy to do multiplies by powers of two. And that's different from an IMOL instruction, which has to take two numbers that are unknown and multiply them together and then that's much more akin to you doing long multiplication if you've ever had to sit down and write you know multiply four five six seven times one two three four and you sit there and do all of the, the complicated maths that's what the computer essentially has to do as opposed to just knowing ahead of time it's a hundred and just putting two zeros on the end hopefully that covers that um, we'll talk about it at the end if not and I realize I'm going far too slowly here, even for myself here. We'll just take a quick look at the kind of code that I see all over the place in code bases that I work in, where, uh, yet again, um, software engineers are trying to outsmart the compiler. So here's a divide by 16. And this also takes advantage um, of the human saying, I know that when I divide by a power of two, that's the same as shifting down by um, the log of that power of two. So shifting down by four is the same as dividing by 16. But there's a huge issue with this. So I've put the comment here. Clearly, I can't trust the compiler to do this for me. And the reason you might think that you can't trust the compiler to do this for you is here's a divide by 16 written this way, a down, down four. And it does do just the shift arithmetic right is what that is. But if I write a divided by 16 here instead, whoops, 16 instead, there's a whole bunch of extra instructions that get written. I'm like, why are you doing this compiler? I know that it's just a shift. But what's happened really is the compiler is correct and I'm wrong. My intuition is wrong about this shift here. And the reason it's wrong is because integers are signed. And if you just shift an integer down, even if you do it preserving the sign bit, you round the wrong way. And I can kind of demonstrate that very, very cheesily by, let's just put this back to what it was. So this is a broken piece of code, right? If I go uh, int uh, test equals divide by 16, 16, we know that it should be equal to one. And you can see this is the, the magical piece of code that's doing the divide. The compiler knows how to work this out, right? So it says, okay, that's equal to one. Brilliant, okay. So what if I do minus 16? It's minus one. Okay, that makes sense so far. So far, so good. But what about minus one? What is minus one divided by 16? Well, if it's doing the right thing, then that should be zero, right? We should round away towards zero. But in this case, minus one divided by 16 is minus one still. So we've got a problem. If we use the regular actual dividing by 16 code here, then we get the right answer of zero here. So the, sh the downward shift was incorrect it's a human intuition. If you just happen to know that all of your integers are always positive, that's not what the compiler can do. The compiler can't rely on that. The way that you tell the compiler that your integers can't possibly be negative is to say unsigned int a, and it returns an unsigned int. And now you'll see that the compiler correctly generates the code that the human wanted it to generate. You have to tell the compiler all the information it needs to be able to answer the, uh, uh, to degenerate the best code. Obviously there are some issues to do with being careful about truncating your, your integers and signed integers, but this is about compilers, not style here. Okay. Uh, compilers are super smart about um, all sorts of things here. So very, very quickly on this one, this sum up to function is um, a function I've written to sum the values through zero up to X. So it's, you know, like the big sigma 
um, zero through X. So, you know, zero plus one plus two plus three plus four plus dot 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 plus X is what I want it to answer. And you can see the code that's generated on the right hand side by GCC is actually pretty straightforward. Now, um, the, the first thing it's doing is it's saying, well, if the number you've given me is zero, why don't I just say the answer is zero? So it's special case, the fact that if, if, uh, if X coming in is zero, then the answer is zero. Otherwise, we see some Zors, which is weird. And then we see a little loop here. This L3 thing is a loop. And this jump, J and E is a jump if not equal to go back round to the loop. And so in this loop, we can see that it's adding the next number in, incrementing, have we got to the end? So that's the I plus plus and the I is less than X and jumping back round to the loop. So it's doing a fairly straightforward thing here of just adding exactly as we told it to in our sum. Let's talk about those Zors though, because I did say earlier, it's unusual to see Zors, right? You don't write them in your code. And certainly there is no exclusive or that I've written over here on this side. The clue we'll see is that if I mouse over the auto total equals zero U over here, the line that's highlighted is one of those Zors, and it's Zor EAX EAX. Now, what happens if you take a value and exclusive or it with itself? Two one bits go to a zero, two zero bits go to a zero. And we know that the two values are identical. So all the values end up being zero. This is a, a, a shorthand way of the compiler saying, set EAX to zero, which seems like a weird thing. Why would it use an exclusive or when it could just go mov EAX comma zero? And the reason for that is that it's a sm shorter opcode. Now, if I quickly go into binary mode here, now we get to see all the numbers that are, make up the instructions. So the instructions are themselves just numbers stored in memory. And we can see that ZOR EAX EAX is represented by the hex value 31 followed by the hex value C0. If I turn the optimizer off somewhere deep down here, now we get to see the equivalent mov EAX comma zero, and that is B8 zero, 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 zero. There have to be four for the thir four bytes worth of zeros to, to have this, the constant of zero loaded into the EAX register. Apparently B8 is mov EAX comma and oh, 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 oh is the zero that comes after it. So this takes five bytes of memory, whereas the equivalent ZOR was only two. Oops, where are we? So EAX, EAX, 31C0. So it's, it's saving memory. And there are some other boring architectural reasons, well, actually quite exciting architectural reasons why that's that's also better, but we, we haven't got the time to, to talk about those. Now, I have an... A, <coughs> Excuse me. I have an admission to make. I've deliberately picked an old version of GCC here because if I choose a newer version of GCC, oh no, sorry. If I choose a Clang instead of GCC, a very different thing happens. So you can see the difference between compilers here. And this is one of the cool things that Compiler Explorer lets you do. You'll notice here we have the same check is the answer, sorry, is the input zero? If so, go to LBB01, which says set the result to be zero and return. Otherwise, we've got some more LEAs, a multiply. Wait a second, there's no multiply in my code. A shift, there's no shift. Another LEA, what, a deck? And a Hang on a second, there's no loop here. There is no loop in the case of the value not being zero. How come there's no loop? I've got a loop in my code, and there's no loop over here. That's something that's really, really, really crazy. What on earth is the compiler doing? And so it turns out that what the compiler has done is it has worked out that there is a closed form solution to the sum of integers from zero to X, and it has substituted that in instead. So it's taken my loop, it's understood what my loop is doing, and it has said, hey, I can take your order N algorithm and replace it by an order one algorithm. And so what it's really done is this, which is equivalent to X, X plus one over two, which is how I think of the sum of integers. Um, the reason it's not exactly the same is, is quite technical um, there's some rounding things, sorry, not rounding, there's some overflow related things. And there's also the way that the compiler actually de detects this. It's not special case for this. It just falls naturally out of the way Clang does um, induction variables. But I'm just saying the compiler is really, really, really clever. You should let it do its thing. And uh, it can do these kinds of clever tricks. Okay, that's the end of the math section here. I'm just going to take a quick look at the questions and um, we covered that one. We covered that one. I'm all, what does the red tick mark mean that's right beside the compiler name? All right, I'll get to that. Um, 
in a second. So we're going to look forward and I'll show you in, in situ about that one. So, so far we've just looked at some very straightforward, um, simple maths. And I've gone very quick. I appreciate that. And we've got a load more things to do. So we might end up skipping some bits. We'll have to see. But I want to talk about vectorization because our CPUs these days have very large instruction uh, registers, very large registers that allow us to do multiple pieces of work on one piece of, sorry, the same piece of work on multiple pieces of data simultaneously. And that lets us go very much faster for a certain type of activity. And you may have seen this, it's called SIMD. Um, and I want to show you that your compiler actually can do some of this stuff for you. You don't have to necessarily know all about it. You may already be taking advantage of it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a sip of this. And my cat has woken up <laughs> and is around, so. <laughs> so I'm going to take this example. This um, simple piece of code takes a vector of integers, that is a dynamic array of integers, and it's going to return the squared sum of those integers. That is, it's going to take each element, square it, and add it to a total, and then return that total. And as you can see here, I've written it in a very simplistic loop-based way. We'll, we'll show some more C++ code in a second. Um, and this might be useful for like if you're doing um, normalization of values, um, that kind of stuff. This is, this is not just a completely made up example. It's quite often you want to divide through by the, the square root of the, uh, of the square sum of squares. So let's take a look at what the compiler can do with this. Okay, well, over here on the right-hand side, um, we've got the code. And the first thing we need to look at, we need to understand what a vector really looks like, right? So you, you and I may use a standard vector all the time. Inside of that standard vector, there is going to be some pointers. There's going to be a pointer to the begin of the vector, the, the memory that stores the first element. And there's going to be a pointer to the end that stores the end of the, the range of that vector in memory. There's also another one that points somewhere else, but we don't need to worry about that for this. And it just so happens that those two pointers live in the first and the eighth memory address of the pointer itself. So over here, we've passed a, a, a vector by reference. That's a great thing in C++ is references. We know that they, are, uh, they can't be rebound, they can't be null, all those good things. But as far as the CPU is concerned, a reference and a pointer are exactly the same. So we don't see anything new or different about the way references are on the in the CPU side. So we know that the RDI uh, parameter, which is the first and only parameter to this function, is actually a pointer to the vector. That doesn't mean it is pointing at the first integer in that vector. It's pointing at the block of memory that has the pointers to the beginning and the end. And so the first two instructions over here are reading the begin, and the end out of that vector. The next thing we're doing here is ZOR EAX, EAX. This is um, setting our result to zero, and the compiler has decided to use the EAX register to store the running total, because then it's in the right place to return, right? It's clever like that. It, it knows where the result is going to be used. We check to see, is begin equal to end? Because of course, if begin is equal to end, there's nothing in this vector, and so the answer is zero. So we can just return. Otherwise, we fall into a loop. This loop here is effectively the code on the, the, the bit over here with the res plus equals i times i bit. We're going to say, read one of the integers from where the begin pointer is. We're going to move the begin pointer forward by four bytes. If you think uh, a 32-bit integer is four bytes long, so the CPU is working in, in memory addresses, not elements here. We're going to multiply the value we read out by itself. So this is edx equals edx times edx. That's the squaring happening right there. And then we're going to add it to our running total in eax. OK, so far, so good. Finally, we say, has our new begin pointer, which really isn't the begin anymore, right? We've moved it forward. Has that reached the end? If it hasn't, go back round in a loop. And then when we finished, if it has reached the end, 
uh, EAX is our running total. It's in the right register we can return. And it's kind of annoying, actually. It offends me every time I do this presentation and I see that the, the L4 ret and line 14 ret, they could just be the same ret, right? But don't worry about that. So it's pretty straightforward. The compiler has transliterated our code as we might have expected. So far, so good. But we can do better than this. If I don't hamstring the compiler here, if I don't leave it on like a low optimization setting, I'm going to put it on 03 now. And you can see why I, I haven't previously done this. As soon as I put it on 03, the code leaps up in size here. We've got a huge amount of code generated here. It's like, what's 90 lines of code? And it's a lot harder to follow. And this sort of comes back to my idea of intuition and being careful to profile and benchmark your code because you might reasonably look at this and go, my golly, that's a lot of instructions. This is surely much slower. I mean, look at it, it's huge. And so you're like, well, my, I, I would probably go back to this. This is only a few instructions. It's gotta be better, but no. The compiler here has done something very, very clever. And I'm not gonna go through every single thing here. It's too much here. What I'm gonna concentrate on is the bit that looks like a loop. So whenever I'm doing this, I, my heuristic is to look for a loop. And what that loop usually looks like is a label, like this .l4 colon, and shortly afterwards, a compare and a jump. And so this I know is the loop. This is a loop. Now, the bit above it is some code, and the bit below it is some other complicated code. But the main crux of this is a loop here. And the way that I can tell that this is going to be good, inverted commas, is that I can see this loop is looping not four bytes at a time, you remember we were doing add four each time for each int. It's going 32 bytes at a time. So every iteration around this loop, somehow we are processing 32 bytes, which is eight integers. And the way that we're processing eight integers is the compiler is picking up into this YMM register, which is a very wide 256 bit wide register. It's picking up 32 bytes worth of our input data and putting it into this huge register, it's then able to do a square of that register. And those squares are treated individually as if they are eight integers being squared individually in eight little buckets within that one YMM register. And then finally, we're doing a VP add da -da 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 to sum up those eight with an eight wide subtotal. Uh, then we do the comparison and we jump around. And then the code above and below is just some cleanup and some checking code. So I'm going to show you now the equivalent um, uh, the code that the compiler has generated. And hopefully we'll go into a little bit more detail rather than getting lost in the C++, sorry, getting lost in the assembly code. So the, com the compiler has rewritten my loop to look something like this. Instead of having one result, I have eight results. And now I'm stepping through the, the, the array eight at a time. I'm ignoring the fact that if there are fewer than eight or if there are not a multiple of eight here, that's what all that code above and below was handling. So I'm going to step through them eight at a time. And then I'm going to be doing the squaring and the adding individually for each of those eight subtotals. And I've had to write it out as a loop here, but really that's those are just single instructions there because we can operate on eight at a time in, in assembly, whereas we can't in C++. Now that's all well and good. The squaring and this addition is happening eight wide, but I need one total, not eight totals, which is what I would get. So each of those eight totals is actually one eighth of all of the values. And so what I need to do at the end to get the real result is I need to add all of those eight subtotals together. And the compiler has turned my code, whoops, my code that was very straightforward like this and was easy for me to understand into this very complicated but much faster code. And that's really, really cool. That's really clever. Um, now there's, there's obviously, it wouldn't be a C++ talk if I didn't show something which was actually C++. I'm sure uh, you're all tearing your hair out and thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, well you stop using C code or you know, C with classes, sorry. Yeah. So let's have a look at what this would look like if we were to use standard accumulate instead, right? So I can use standard accumulate. I can give it the beginning and end of the vector. I can use the, uh, an empty T's uh, as the starting value. And then I'm going to give it a little lambda, which is going to say, how do I aggregate these together? Well, I take the old value and I add the, the squared value of the right-hand side. And then, oh, there's no assembly to dis display on this side. Well, what, what's going on here? 
So this is unusual. Um, I've written code, but I don't see any assembly. And this is, you probably, if you've used the site, you've probably realized what's happening here. Uh, what, what has happened here is that this is a, a function template. It's not a real function. It doesn't exist. The compiler doesn't know what T is, so it hasn't generated any code. So we have to tell it what T is. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to say auto test const vector of int amp v return sum squared of v. Hopefully I've got that right. Yay. So I've just given it a concrete example of this. There are other ways to do this. This is just the easy way that, for me to remember. Now, I'm not going to go through this over here because this, this code looks familiar-ish. And you can see, well, the main thing is that loop is exactly the same as we saw before. So even though I'm using all the cool C++ tricks of the world of using you know the standard, I say C++ tricks, gosh, I mean, it's decent programming practices. <laughs> the compiler can see through all of that and generates the same fast code. But now, of course, I can experiment and say, well, what if this isn't an integer anymore? Very often, if you're using sums of squares of things, you're dealing with floating point values, right? So I'm expecting to be able to change this to float and see the same performant code. And indeed, on the face of it, it's looking good, right? It's the same blo block of code here. This is the same kind of thing as before. I'm seeing it do 32 at a time. This is a great sign that it's picking up eight floats now and doing eight at a time. It's doing a multiply with itself, that's great, but then it gets worse. And now I'm looking for the end of the loop, and the end of the loop is down here now, and this is very sad to me. I have an entire screen's worth of code for each eight block of floating point numbers. And that makes me sad, because I know that this can probably go faster. And normally I would do a big old call and response thing here with an audience, but to save us all the time, the uh, this is one of those horrible like interview questions that people might ask you so it's a bit mean to ask in a, in this setting but you know why might this be and the clue here is that the compiler could make a transformation before with the integer case remember it was taking eight separate subtotals and then summing them up at the end and the reason the compiler can do that is because it doesn't matter which order you add up integers you always get the same answer and the compiler knows that 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 is not true with floating point numbers. A plus B plus C is not the same as A plus B plus C, right, with parentheses around B plus C, or C plus B plus A, or any of the other combinations of A plus B plus C. And the standard and the IEEE um, stat spec say that if you want to be conformant, you have to do them in the order, yeah, sorry, you have to do floating point operations in the order the programmer specified which means the compiler isn't allowed to reorder those ads to turn it into subtotals and then add the subtotals at the end because that's a different answer. So that's a shame. It's a shame. And it's very unfortunate. Um, just because I want to show you how cool it can be, I'm going to turn off the flag uh, that, um, that prevents, sorry, I'm going to turn on the flag that lets me turn off that assumption. And I'm going to use the uh, F unsafe math optimization. So I do not recommend this in general. Examinations, plural. Yes, there we are. Okay. So what I've said to the compiler is, hey, it's fine for to reorder floating point operations and a whole bunch of other things as well. I would definitely say consult your compiler documentation, probably just pragma it off in, in close places. The reason that you want to do this is that this does change the calculation. And I think as Chandler Caruso likes to say, you're inviting unbounded precision loss, which means that the compiler can, in theory, just give you a bogus result. Now, it, it doesn't in this case. But, you know, your mileage may vary, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, what we've said now is the compiler is allowed to do that call optimization. And if we now look down at the, the loop, we can see the loop is doing 32 bytes at a time, so it's doing eight floats. And then it's been able to find this behemothly complicated sounding instruction, vmf add 231 which I think you find just rolls off the tongue. It's a very easy to say thing. No, this v this means a vector floating point multiply add where the operands are two, then three, then one. Two, two then three, then one. I don't know why it decided to do it that way around. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, par uh, parallel and then single precision. This is a multiply add. This is actually a plus equals with a multiply at the same time. So it's able to do the add and the square in one instruction for all eight of these things. That's just crazy. It's so cool. 
And so now our, our loop is actually slightly more efficient than it was with integers, which boggles my mind. Um, and so here the compiler has managed to get what one, two, three, four, five instructions to process eight floating point squares and adds. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And I didn't do anything over here other than admittedly turn off this really scary warning over here, but you know, nothing to see. Do not look behind the curtain. And there's some other stuff that it's, it's not cheap to actually do the, the sum across them afterwards. This, this is another complicated thing that happens. But anyway, just wanted to show you that the compiler really is smart and works hard for you. Now, I believe that with some of the C++ 17 or C++ 20 features with std, and there's a different thing than accumulate, it's like transform map or reduce or something. Maybe it's std reduce. There is a way of saying order doesn't matter. And it's usually used to hint to the, 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 the compiler that it can, sorry, the, the STL, that it can use multiple threads and therefore can chunk the work up. But I believe it might be possible for the compiler to eventually intuit that it can also do this kind of reordering for those operations. But anyway, I just wanted to show you this because it's, this is so cool. Um, and I know this is this is off script now, so if I do something silly now, um, I apologize. But I want to show you a cool thing that we can do. Um, I'm going to add a new uh, editor. Uh, no, not that. I have used this site before, source editor. I'm going to change the language to be uh, analysis. Oh, no, I haven't got this locally. Darn it. Okay, this, this is why I shouldn't go off. off, off. I'm going to go to the actual live site. So I've been running a local compiler explorer because I'm used to doing this in a way that... Um, um, doesn't um, doesn't require me to have internet access. But if I go to the live site, and this is the dark theme for what it's worth, I can paste this into the analysis view, and then I can pick LLVM MCA. And what this allows us to do is actually analyze the, uh, the, the performance uh, of the instructions. This is like all the internal details of what um, a Skylake, oh, no, well, let's do mArch equals Skylake, which is the computer I'm actually running on. And... Um, Oh, MCPU. Again, I should never go off script. There we are, right. So th this is it now analyzing those instructions and telling me how many or how much resources on the CPU it actually uses and, and which ports it goes through. And, and it can tell us things like, um, so the reason I've, I've pasted this in, I just pasted in the core of the loop. And so it can tell me that each cycle uh, through a block, um, if it was to do 100 iterations of that block, there would be 500 instructions run. It would take 410 cycles, which is crazy. That's so fast. But again, you should measure it rather than you rely on these tools. They're not perfect. All right. Okay. That was definitely off script. Let's uh, turbo through this. Okay. I am going to uh, take a moment over here. I didn't do the red tick mark. I'm sorry. I will do that the next time around. I promise. Um, could I change the M arch to something which doesn't have an FMA? Yes, I can quickly. Uh, I don't know if I can do that now quickly. Of course, I've, I've just done this. Uh, what I can do is I can show a feature that not many people know. This is the history feature of Compiler Explorer, where I'm going to go back to what it was before. There we go. So if you've ever opened a link and then gone, oh, gosh, I was working in, a, in Compiler Explorer. Now I've lost it. Um, that we keep a whole bunch of previous states that you can go back to here. And you can even diff against them and see what the difference was. Um, so top tip there. Uh, that, that usually surprises somebody. They're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. So here, um, we're going to put the uh, fun safe math optimizations back on. It's F unsafe. I just say fun safe because it amuses me. Um, and then I want to turn it onto something which doesn't have an FMA. So let's try what, 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 what? Sandy Bridge. There we go. So with the Sandy Bridge, it, um, it, it's slightly different again because we don't have the YMM units. Um, it's still doing 32 at a time, but it's doing something else. I'm not quite sure what it's doing. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not 100% sure, but it's obviously doing the multiply and then the add separately because it hasn't got a multiply and add unit, uh, which, which, is, which is unfortunate. I think, did it, was it Ivy Bridge that came in? There are so many silly names of these things. No, Ivy Bridge is not that too. Okay. Um, so that's that one done. Um, please read SDI as RSI. Oh, did I say something wrong there? I apologize uh, if. Oh, that, that's no, in, no, no. in Muli's. That's oh. a continuation. I this, see. This I understand. This is related to the, uh, another question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I understand now. Oh, and the red tick mark. Okay, so now I've actually remembered this. If, if you're referring to this little green thing over here, this is, if I type moo in my code here, uh, the red 
this red mark, tick mark here, or is there another one? I, if, if, the, if the person can, can uh, uh, clarify, this one at least tells you that it didn't compile correctly. But you can also, there's another sort of secret hint of how Compiler Explorer works. You can click on it, and you can see the command line options that we ran the compiler with, which is maybe not that useful always. But sometimes when you're trying to reproduce something exactly at home, you can copy this, and then you can paste it into your own compiler and say, oh, this is what we ran with. Um, that may be not what the answer was. I, there may be other red tick marks that I'm not thinking about. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. So oops, I don't know what happened there. OK. Um, Red ticks. Uh, how does the compiler access global variables and DLLs and thread local variables? Well, I mean, that we can go into at the end. So I will come back to that one. And we can talk a little bit um, about those. But um, um, that would be very much um, shooting from the hip, as it were. Now, in terms of time, I realize I'm already 10 minutes over like the hand-waving time. So I'm, I'm going to trust in my, my moderators to tell me to shush. <laughs> when the time is up. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going, um, and you'll have to drag me away. So we're going to go into some architectural tidbits. And what do I mean by architectural? I mean, there are some things inside CPUs that are very specific to that CPU. We've already seen that with the LEA instruction, where the compiler is very clever about using this versatile instruction for things that it wasn't designed for. But there are sometimes some very very domain-specific instructions inside your, your compiler that you, you might not be aware of, or you might have heard you have to use assembly instructions to get access to, or maybe intrinsics. So let's talk a little bit about that. This is one of my favorites here. This is one of those weird things that you might want to do, and it's one of those weird things that, again, companies that do such things, and I would dissuade companies from doing this, but sometimes the interview questions you might get would be these strange things like, Given a value A, can you tell me how many set bits there are in the binary representation of A? And to which you should answer, I would prefer to work at another company that doesn't use stupid questions. Um, or you can write something like this. Um, so this is the count number of set bits function that, that I would write. And the way that this works is I have a value A. I say, well, the number of bits starts out as 0. And then while a is not 0, I know that there must be at least one set bit. So I'm going to increment my count. And then I, because I like to find, I like to do these kinds of little mental arithmetic tricks here, I happen to know, or you can Google, this is how to clear the bottom set bit. So we know that there must be set bits, because a is not equal to 0. So there must be some set bits. Um, this magic takes the bottom of those set bits. We don't know which one it is, but the bottom one and clears it. And this is a cool thing, actually. I would encourage you, if you're interested in such things, to sit down and work out why this works. Why, if you take A minus 1 and and it with A, do you clear the bottom set bit? It's a fun thing to do. Just make up a little uh, like five-bit binary number and work it through by hand. It's a fun little thing. But it does do it. It works. Anyway, so then we cl clear the bottom bit, bottom set bit, and we go back round again. And of course, if A is 0 now, th that's it. We counted all the bits, we return. So let's see what the compiler generates for this. Hey, it looks pretty similar, right? There's, I can just, again, using my squinting technique, I can see there's a bit at the top that does a jump out. And we're used to seeing that. Like at the beginning of a loop, it says, well, if there's nothing to do, then don't bother going into the loop. And then I'm, I'm training my eyes to look at like a label and a jump. So that is a loop there. OK, brilliant. So set our count to 0. Is our input 0? Then we're finished. Otherwise, oh, look, count plus plus. That's increment EAX. We've got at least one bit set. Oh, blizzard. Wow, this is a new thing. I don't know what blizzard is. So let's mouse over it. And it tells me copies all bits from the source operand to the destination bit and resets equals 0, the bit position at the destination operand that corresponds to the lowest set bit of the source operand. Wow. That instruction is exactly what I wanted. It's clearing the bottom set bit, like I said over here. So the compiler has been really smart and said, I, there's an instruction which does this a and equals a minus 1. There's no anding or a minus equals 1. What a clever compiler. And so it's going to loop around here. Brilliant. And we're done. Except that I'm kind of being unkind to the compiler here. I'm de deliberately using a slightly older version of the compiler. This is the part that I meant to say earlier when I said I'm using an old compiler. So if we just pick, I don't know, the latest compiler, we'll see something cleverer happens. Oh, wow. 
my entire function vanishes and is replaced by this instruction. Because it turns out, as well as having a clear the lowest set bit instruction, there is also an instruction which just says, count the number of set bits in the register. And so this is perfect. It's just doing exactly what I've got over here. And I just want you to think about this. This is the compiler has recognized my code, which is non-trivial, like there's 11 lines of code here, including some funny gnarly bit manipulation tricks. It has recognized that this is a counting the number of set bits, and it has been able to replace the whole thing with a single instruction. That's just a, an amazing achievement for the compilers. And, and Clang has done this much longer than GCC, for what it's worth. Uh, that's great. Um, if we look at Clang, uh, you can see it's done this. And uh, GCC does the, the funny thing here is that as you go back over in time, you'll see, where are we? Where did it first come in? Was it 9.1? Oh, darn it. First Clang. There we go. Right. So Clang 10 literally just does the pop count. Hey, pop count EAX, EDI, RET, which is what I would imagine you would write. As a, as a human, knowing that there was a pop count instruction, you're like, hey, count the number of bits in EDI and put the result in EAX. I'm done. But then Clang 11 has this funny C move instruction. And GCC has always done, hey, set the result to zero and then cop count the number of bits into the result. Why would you do these things? Why on earth? And why did Clang not do it first? So it turns out that making a CPU is really, really, really hard. And CPUs have bugs in them. And so there isn't a correctness bug. But in a lot of um, Intel CPUs that have the pop count instruction, there is a false dependency on the previous value of EAX. Basically, there's a dependency tracking system inside the chip that tries to um, speed things up for want of a better word, make, run things in parallel. And it is broken for pop count. But it can be worked around by just clearing EAX before you write into it, or in the case of Clang, doing a conditional move afterwards. That sort of launders this bug. It's not a correctness bug. There's nothing wrong with the Clang 10 code over here. It just will not run quite as fast as you might want it to otherwise. And I think it's just crazy that the compilers are smart enough to know how to target and work around the bugs that are in CPUs. So that's the counting number of set bits. Why you might want to count the number of set bits is as there's a whole other talk. Um, it is actually useful, right? I haven't just made it up. But that's why, after all, the Intel engineers and, and you know other manufacturers, AMD, ARM, they all have population count instructions because it's it's handy for certain data structures and it's easy for them to do. Um, if you've ever had to deal with big endian and little endian and dealing with switching backwards and forwards. Um, and you haven't used N2HS or the equivalent Unix functions or Windows functions, you may have found yourself writing a piece of code like this where you take a 32-bit integer and you break it into the four bytes that make it up by reading out each bit individually, and then you combine them back again in the opposite order, right? We've all written that code. Compilers are really smart, as we've probably we've picked up by now. They're quite happy to use the byte swap instruction, which does all the work for you. And that's very clever, right? It's, again, it's recognize this whole sequence of code and use the byte swap instruction to switch it around. Even cleverer, actually, is if I say, uh, let's say uint32t get foo, and this takes a uint32t uh, star t, so some other t, and I'm going to return switch bits of star t. So this way, I am just reading from memory and returning it. Uh, there is an instruction which, while it's reading from memory, switch is the order. So in switch bits, it was forced, because we had to pass the value by register, it was forced to use an in-place byte swap. If it happens to know that it's reading from memory, it can actually use the switch it as I read it um, BE version of the MOV instruction, which is, again, it's just clever. So again, compilers are smart. They've got your back. Write code that makes sense for you, which may or may not be this complicated bunch of code here. It may just be better to use someone else's code that already does this. <coughs> Excuse me but it will do the right thing for you. All right, I think we're nearly there now. Oh, this is a clever thing. I, I've i always, um, you know, there, there is a standard routine to say, is a character a space or not? And in the world of Unicode, of course, there are many, many other choices for this. 
Um, Unicode is far too complicated a topic to be talking about at nearly two in the morning. So we're going to deal with like a simple ASCII parser. And I'm sure you've written something a bit like this if you've written any kind of parsing code. You know, like, hey, is this particular character in a set of interesting characters to me? And you say, is it either a space? In this case, is it a space or is it a return or is it a new line or is it a tab? And there are, of course, other white space exists. Your mileage may vary. I was knocked out when I thought, saw this because I was expecting the compiler to generate a sequence of compares and lots of branches. Like, literally, is it a space? If so, go, go to return true. Is it a, 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 a return? If so, go to true. Is it a new line? Go to true. Else, is it a tab? Go to true. Well, it must be false then. Right, and I expected that, but the code on the right-hand side is so much more concise, and it's kind of hard to see what it's doing. If I mouse over this big constant over here, there's a sort of clue here. It's like, well, this is an unusual-looking number. Why would you be using this here? Uh, we look at what Clang does. It's it's a similar thing. There's some moves and there's some numbers and there's some shifts. And because we're running low on time, I'm just going to skip to the end of this one. It has turned our set of, of comparison values. It's the compiler has noticed that those values fall in a small range. And so it just does a quick range check to see, are we is the value wildly outside of the range? And then if so, it jumps and says it's not. Otherwise, it uses the index of the, so the, the, the value as an index into a lookup table. And that lookup table is one bit per value encoded as a constant and the bit ones are only set where the characters are valid where it wants to return true so it has turned our function of a bunch of cascading ifs into a lookup table for us and it's done a really clever done it really cleverly so super smart again i i keep saying this i know but the compilers are smart trust the compilers it's just wonderful to see them at work um how are we doing on time because i've got one last couple of bits here and if we're still good Anchor, uh, are we good? Or yeah, uh... let's continue, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let's continue. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, then we shall. So we're going to talk. This is the last section. So those who are still still with us, I'm going to show you some things that perhaps are not so clever. These are just things you should be aware about. And a lot of these things boil down to the compiler is only as smart as the information it's given. And we kind of saw that earlier with like the signed versus unsigned in the divide, right? If you know that your number is unsigned, then the compiler can't intuit that unless you tell it. So here is our sum up to um, function again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you remember this is the one that it cleverly turned into the, the constant time n, n plus 1 over 2 equivalent? And this time, instead of just totaling up the i, I'm calling the identity function here. But as far as the compiler is concerned, um, this is what the identity function looks like. It's just an unsigned, that's, uh, a function that takes an unsigned and returns an unsigned. Now, obviously, it doesn't read my comment here. Whoa, is, whoa, well, it would be clever if it did. Um, where I just say, hey, this just returns num. It doesn't do anything to num. We know that. The compiler doesn't, though. And if we look at what happens when the compiler doesn't know, oh, dear, it's very sad. So this is Clang, which was doing all those clever optimizations. And sadly... It is just looping and calling our identity. All those optimizations have gone out of, uh, out of the window because it doesn't know what an identity does. And that's sad, right? Now, obviously, if I could show it what identity does, if I actually say return num over here, we recover our beautiful um, closed form solution. So again, the compiler is only as smart as the information it has available to it. And this is one of those examples where I think it's said that inlining is like the mother of all optimizations. Essentially, the more inlining the compiler can do, the more things it can notice. So obviously, once it inlines the identity function here, uh, it can see, oh, this is just doing nothing. This is I, I can see this is just a total plus equals i. So I can now do the optimization I was doing before with my, my clever um, um, thingamajig. I can't think what the word is now, a uh, closed form solution. So the compiler needs to be able to see these, the body of the function in order to make these kinds of, of intuit, uh, intuitions. <clears throat> now, there are two ways it can see the body of the function. One is that you literally put the function right next to it here, you know, in the header file, or if it was in the header file, you'd have to make it in line. All those good things, right? You've, you've all done these kinds of things. Another way 
and the one that I prefer is if you can possibly do it, turn on the link time code generation. A link time code generation allows the compiler to defer a lot of these de optimization decisions until the whole program is ready to be linked, at which point it can see the identity function, and it can say, oh, I know what that's doing. It's a little harder to get set up, but most compilers since, you know, early 2000s even, have had a link time code generation step, and that's pretty cool. And rather sadly, that's one of the few things I can't show you with Compiler Explorer. I can't actually do that. But that, that feature is coming soon. So one day we'll be able to, I'll be able to talk about that. Um, there are some things you can do with extensions to say that functions are either pure, which means they have no side effects, or that they are, oh, I can't remember the other one. There's some other ways of annotating, but those are very non-standard, and they are, they're, they're, they're sometimes very, sometimes they can be useful, but I won't show them here because I, I don't have anything prepared for it. So uh, another way we could write our sum up to function is to, is to pass in, you know, a more functional or object, uh, what do they call it, invocable function, uh, like this func here, which is a, a function object. Let's have a look at that. So here our function uh, is defined inside the header so the compiler can see it. And so yet again, obviously, it has done our optimization. It's done our closed form solution. That's great. Uh, however, you know, if you're going to pass in a function like this, especially the way that I've written it here, and if you forgive me for not writing a virtual destructor because life's too short, right here. Um, what if I were to make this virtual? You would imagine, like the compiler has done over here, um, all bets are off now. Again, we are no longer doing our lovely optimization. We're no longer doing that um, um, closed form solution because while we've been given a func here, the compiler can't guarantee that somebody else isn't overloading func and passing a subclass where it maybe does something different with x. So the compiler has to be uh, cautious here and assume that, 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 that it's not a func here. And so Clang in particular here has just gone back to the old way of saying, well, I'm going to call that virtual function every time round and I'm going to loop forever. But GCC, interestingly, has a trick up its sleeve. So there's an arms race going on here between the two compilers. Let's take a look at what GCC has done here. Um, sort of using, again, my sort of squinting to find the loop technique, there's L5, there's an L5. Okay, so this is the loop here. There's a bit more complicated stuff going on. So let's take a look. Um, the compiler is reading out um, the... Oh, I'm going to have to read this now. I've forgotten how this works. Moving out that... That is getting the, the V table pointer out of the object. And without getting into a deep dive about how this stuff works, just bear with me on this. And then it's reading the first entry out of that V table, which just happens to be the address of this function. So this is saying, hey, I want to jump to this function um, to do the work. And now this is where Clang just jumped to that address. It's Clang just said, okay, fine, I'm just going to jump to the function that you said. But GCC is going to do something else first. It's going to say, well, what if, if I make a bet, what if, the, what if it is this func? What if it's this particular implementation I've got here, right? I, I know that there is exactly one implementation of func right now, so why don't I just make a guess? So I'm, instead of calling the function directly, I'm going to say, is it exactly equal to the func colon colon operator blah, blah, blah int? And if it is, go up here. Otherwise, OK, now we know that it, it isn't uh, a func anymore. We're going to just call the function and deal with, the, deal with it here. So this is the loop that happens if it's uh, not a func. If it is a func, it's going to jump up to L5. And there's no function call here. It's just inc a e e b x and add. It has inlined a virtual function call, which is just amazing. It's amazing that it's been able to make a guess and say, I'm going to assume this is probably a func. And if it is, I can inline it because it's cheaper than calling a function. It's not perfect because it still does this lookup every single time. And there are complicated reasons why that's not true yet. And Clang is working on this too. But it's not quite as expensive as you might imagine it would be. So virtual functions can be less expensive than you might think. And certainly in the codes that I work on, where I have virtual functions, they're often in objects that I'm only making virtual so that I can test them by having like a test version of that object. And so oftentimes, if, uh, if I have link time code generation on, link time optimization on, I don't link against my test code in my production binaries 
that's a great hint to the compiler that there is exactly only one implementation of those functions. And so oftentimes, it's able to devirtualize uh, using this kind of technique. This is actually called speculative devirtualization because it doesn't know for certain this isn't something other than the, uh, the, the, um, the funk that we've given it. Um, there are other things that, uh, that can be done, like full devirtualization um, in other cases. But Clang will get there too, I'm certain. I'm, I'm sure that this is going to happen. I think Piotr Padlowinski was looking at it most recently when I spoke to him. Anyway, so I have now finally got to the end, a, half, a full half an hour later than everyone's uh, expected. Let's just talk about the conclusion. So first of all, the compilers are cleverer than we are, right? I think we can all agree that compilers, and by extension, compiler authors are cleverer than we are, right? We just write, hopefully, sensible-looking code, and compilers go to enormous lengths to generate beautiful, fast, assembly code for the, the CPU to run, or machine code, really. But they are as, only as clever as the information that we have. So if we can give them as much information as possible, then they will do the, the best job. Hopefully, hopefully you've realized that assembly isn't that scary, and you can sort of use the squint and look for uh, analogs in the code technique, like here's my loop. Oh, how many bytes is it consuming each iteration? Oh, that's that. Okay, it's doing this. That kind of, uh, oops, banging my microphone here. That kind of intuition, rather than having to understand exactly what every single instruction is doing. So really, just trust your compiler. Please don't compromise the readability of your code. Don't be the me of 15 years ago that was constructing multiplies out of shifts and adds. Just write the multiply. If you're having to explain using comments why you're doing some code in some awkward way, take a long step back and think to yourself, does it really have to be written out in this awkward way for performance reasons, or can I just write it simply and rely on the compiler to do the work for me? And do be aware of the compiler limitations, though. You know, I can say that compilers are amazing. We talked about visibility there, whether it can see the functions and the information that's available to it. I didn't have time to talk about aliasing, but that is a thing that can happen as well, very occasionally. Um, so if you if the compiler can't prove that two pointers aren't pointing at the same object, sometimes that prevents it from from being able to do uh, its best job of optimizing. Although again, they're still very clever. Um, so thank you all. Thank you for this opportunity. Obviously, you know where Compiler Explorer is. I think um, I have to say thank you to all the folks that that contribute to the project. It's not just me. Um, I just have the the uh, memorable last name that uh, everyone calls the site. Um, I I do. Uh, have an awful lot of help from folks. And uh, the background images are by Ruben Guy. And please just go off and read some assembly.